and a sprinkling of well-to-do craftsfolk with rich embroidery covering colorful coats or dresses. She hardly noticed them. No fewer than five sisters were staying at the gates of heaven. None known to her from the tower, the light be thanked, and all sat in the common room when she walked in. Master Helvin, the innkeeper, would always make room for an Aes Sedai, even when he had to force other patrons to double up. The sisters kept to themselves, barely acknowledging one another, and people who might not have recognized an Aes Sedai on sight knew them now, knew enough not to intrude. Every other table was jammed, yet where any man sat with an Aes Sedai, it was her warder, a hard-eyed man with a dangerous look about him, however ordinary he might seem otherwise. One of the sisters sitting alone was a red, a fact known only through an overheard comment. Only Falana Bevane, a slim yellow-haired brown in plain dark woolens, wore her shawl. She had been the first to corner Moiraine when she arrived. They had felt her ability as soon as she came close, of course. Tucking her gloves behind her belt and folding her cloak over her arm, she started toward the stone stairs at the back of the room. Not too quickly, but not dawdling either. Looking straight ahead, the sister's eyes following her seemed the touch of fingers. Not quite grasping, none spoke to her. They thought her a wilder, a woman who had learned to channel on her own. That lucky deception had come about by accident, a misperception on Falana's part, but it was bolstered by the presence of a true wilder at the inn. No one knew what Mistress Asher was, except the sisters. Many Aes Sedai disliked wilders, considering them a loss to the tower, yet few went out of their way to make their lives difficult. A merchant in dark gray wool who wore only a red enameled circle pin for jewelry Mistress Asher dropped her eyes whenever a sister glanced at her, but they had no interest in her. Her gray hair ensured that. Then, just as Moiraine reached the staircase, a woman did speak behind her. Well now, this is a surprise. Turning quickly, Moiraine kept her face smooth with an effort as she made a brief curtsy suitable from a minor noblewoman to an eyes Sedai. To two eyes Sedai. Short of Sierran herself, she could hardly have encountered two worse than this pair in sober silks. The white wings in Lorella Tarsi's long hair emphasized her serene, copper-skinned elegance. She had taught Moiraine in several classes, as both novice and accepted, and she had a way of asking the last question you wanted to hear. Worse, the other was Marian. Seeing them together was a surprise. She had not thought they particularly liked one another. Lorella was as strong as Marian, requiring deference, but they were outside the tower now. They had no right to interfere with whatever she might be doing here. Yet if either said the wrong thing here, word that Moiraine Damodred was wandering about in disguise would spread with the sisters in the room, and it would reach the wrong ears as surely as peaches were poison. That was the way of the world. A summons back to Tarvalon would find her soon after. Disobeying the Amalin seat once was bad enough. Twice, and very likely sisters would be sent to bring her back. She opened her mouth, hoping to forestall the chance, but someone else spoke first. No need trying that one, Falana said, twisting around on her bench at a nearby table where she was sitting alone. She had been writing intently in a small leather-bound book and there was an ink stain on the tip of her nose of all places. Says she has no interest in going to the tower. Stubborn as stone about it. Secretive, too. You would think we'd have heard about a wilder popping up even in a lesser Kyrianan house, but this child likes to keep to herself. Lorella and Marian looked at Moiraine, Lorella arching a thin eyebrow, Marian apparently trying to suppress a smile. It is quite true, I said I, Moiraine said carefully, relieved that someone else had laid a foundation. I have no desire to enroll as a novice, and I will not. Falana fixed her with considering eyes, but she still spoke to the others. Says she's twenty-two, but that rule has been bent a time or two. A woman says she's eighteen, and that's how she's enrolled. Unless it's too obvious a lie, anyway. And this girl could easily pass for... 
Our rules were not made to be broken, Lorella said sharply. And Marian added in a wry voice, I don't believe this young woman will lie about her age. She doesn't want to be a novice, Falana. Let her go her way. Moiraine almost let out a relieved sigh. Enough weaker than they to accept being cut off, Falana still began to rise, plainly meaning to continue the argument. Halfway to her feet, she glanced up the stairs behind Moiraine. Her eyes widened, and abruptly she sat down again, focusing on her writing as if nothing in the world existed beyond her book. Marianne and Lorella gathered their shawls, gray fringe and blue swaying. They looked eager to be elsewhere. They looked as though their feet had been nailed to the floor. So this girl does not want to be a novice, said a woman's voice from the stairs. A voice Moiraine had heard only once, two years ago, and would never forget. A number of women were stronger than she, but only one could be as much stronger as this one. Unwillingly, she looked over her shoulder. Nearly black eyes studied her from beneath a bun of iron-gray hair decorated with golden ornaments, stars and birds, crescent moons and fish. Catswain too wore her shawl, fringed in green. In my opinion, girl, she said dryly, you could profit from ten years in white. Everyone had believed Cadswain Malydrin dead somewhere in retirement until she reappeared at the start of the Aiel War, and a good many sisters probably wished her truly in her grave. Cadswain was a legend, a most uncomfortable thing to have alive and staring at you. Half the tales about her came close to impossibility while the rest were beyond it, even among those that had proof. A long-ago king of Tarabon winkled out of his palace when it was learned he could channel, carried to Tarvalon to be gentled, while an army that did not believe chased after to attempt rescue. A king of Arad Doman and a queen of Saldea both kidnapped, spirited away in secrecy, and when Ketswain finally released them, a war that had seemed certain simply faded away. It was said she bent tower law where it suited her, flouted custom, went her own way, and often dragged others with her. I thank the Aes Sedai for her concern, Moiraine began, then trailed off under that stare. Not a hard stare, simply implacable. Supposedly even Amerlins had stepped warily around Cadswain over the years. It was whispered that she had actually assaulted an Amerlin once. Impossible, of course. She would have been executed. Moiraine swallowed and tried to start over, only to find she wanted to swallow again. Descending the stair, Cadswain told Marian and Lorella, Bring the girl. Without a second glance, she glided across the common room. Merchants and craftsfolk looked at her, some openly, some from the corner of an eye, and warders too, but every sister kept her gaze on her table. Marian's face tightened, and Lorella sighed extravagantly, yet they prodded Moiraine after the bobbing golden ornaments. She had no choice but to go. At least Catswain could not be one of the women Tamra had called in. She had not returned to Tarvalon since that visit at the beginning of the war. The Green Sister led them to one of the inn's private sitting rooms, where a fire blazed on the black stone hearth and silver lamps hung along the red wall panels. A tall pitcher stood near the fire to keep warm, and a lacquered tray on a small carved table held silver cups. Marian and Lorella took two of the brightly cushioned chairs, but when Moiraine put her cloak on a chair and started to sit, Cadswain pointed to a spot in front of the other sisters. Stand there, child, she said. Fighting down a searing flare of temper, Moiraine made an effort not to clutch her skirt in fists. Even a woman as strong as Cadswain had no right to order her here. Yet under that remorseless gaze, she stood as directed. Quivering with outrage, she struggled not to utter words she would regret, but she did it. There was something of Swan about this woman, only magnified. Swan had been born to lead. Cadswain had been born to command. She circled the three of them slowly, once, 
twice. Marian and Lorella exchanged wondering frowns, and Lorella opened her mouth, but after one look at Cadswain, closed it again. They assumed smooth-faced serenity. Any watcher would have thought they knew exactly what was going on. Sometimes Cadswain glanced at them, but the greater part of her attention stayed on Moiraine. Most new sisters, the legendary Green said abruptly. Hardly remove their shawls to sleep or bathe, but here you are without shawl or ring in one of the most dangerous spots you could choose, short of the blight itself. Why? Moiraine blinked. A direct question. The woman really did ignore custom when it suited her. She made her voice light. New sisters also seek a warder. Why was the woman singling her out in this manner? I have not bonded mine yet. I am told border men make fine warders. The green sent her a stabbing look that made her wish she had been just a little less light. Stopping behind Lorella, Cadswain laid a hand on her shoulder. What do you know of this child? Every girl in Lorella's classes had thought her the perfect sister and been intimidated by that cool consideration. They all had been afraid of her and wanted to be her. Moiraine was studious and a quick learner, she said thoughtfully. She and Swan Sanche were two of the quickest the tower has ever seen. She must know that. Let me see. She was rather too free with her opinions and her temper until we settled her down. As much as we did settle her. She and the Sanche girl had a continuing fondness for pranks, but they both passed for accepted on the first try. She needs seasoning, of course, yet she may make something of herself. Catswain moved behind Marian, asking the same question, adding, A fondness for pranks, Lorella said. A troublesome child? Marian shook her head with a smile. Not troublesome, really. High-spirited. None of the tricks Moiraine played were mean, but they were plentiful. Novice and accepted she was sent to my study more often than any three other girls, except for her pillow friend Swan. Of course, pillow friends frequently get into tangles together, but with those two, one was never sent to me without the other. The last time, the very night after passing for the shawl. Her smile faded into a frown, very much like the one she had worn that night. Not angry, but rather disbelieving of the mischief young women could get up to, and a touch amused by it. Instead of spending the night in contemplation, they tried to sneak mice into a sister's bed, Elida Arroyhan, and were caught. I doubt any other women have been raised eyes to die while still too tender to sit from their last visit to the Mistress of Novices. Moiraine kept her face smooth, kept her hands from knotting into fists, but she could do nothing about burning cheeks. That ruefully amused frown, as if she were still accepted. She needed seasoning, did she? Well, perhaps she did, some, but still. And spreading out all these intimacies. I think you know all of me that you need to know, she told Cadswain stiffly. How close she and Swan had been was no one's business but theirs. And their punishments, details of their punishments. If you are quite satisfied, I must pack my things. I am departing for Chachin. She swallowed a groan before it could form. She still let her tongue go too free when her temper was up. If Marian or Lorella was part of the search, they must have at least part of the list in her little book. Including Jureen Najima here, the Lady Ines de Main in Chachin, and Avin Sahira, who lived in a village on the high road between Chachin and Canlawam. To strengthen suspicion, all she need do now was say she intended to spend time in Arafel and Shinar next. Katswain smiled, not at all pleasantly. You'll leave when I say, child. Be silent till you're spoken to. That pitcher should hold spiced wine, pour for us. Moiraine quivered, child. She was no longer a novice. The woman could not order her coming and going, or her tongue. But she did not protest. She walked to the hearth, stalked, really, 
and picked up the long-necked silver pitcher. You seem very interested in this young woman, Ketswain, Marian said, turning slightly to watch Moiraine pour. Is there something about her we should know? Lorella's smile held a touch of mockery. Only a touch with Ketswain. Has someone foretold she'll be Armalyn one day? I can't say that I see it in her, but then I don't have the foretelling. I might live another thirty years, Cadswain said, putting out a hand for the cup Moraine offered. Or only three, who can say? Moraine's eyes went wide, and she slopped hot wine over her own wrist. Marian gaped, and Lorella looked as though she had been struck in the forehead with a stone. A little more care with the other cups, the green said, unperturbed by all the gaping. Child? Moiraine returned to the hearth still staring, and Ketswain went on. Malin is considerably older. When she and I are gone, that leaves Kareen the strongest. Lorella flinched. Did the woman mean to violate every custom all in one go? Am I disturbing you? Cadswain's solicitous tone could not have been more false, and she did not wait for an answer. Holding our silence about age doesn't keep people from knowing we live longer than they. Four. From Kareen, it's a sharp drop to the next five. Five once this child and the Sanche girl reach their potential. And one of those is as old as I am and in retirement to boot. Is there some point to this? Marian asked, sounding a little sick. Lorella pressed her hands against her middle, her face gray. They barely glanced at the wine Moiraine offered before gesturing it away, and she kept the cup, though she did not think she could swallow a mouthful. Catswain scowled, a fearsome sight. No one has come to the tower in a thousand years who could match me. No one to match Malin or Kareen in almost six hundred. A thousand years ago, there would have been fifty sisters or more who stood higher than this child. In another hundred years, though, she'll stand in the first rank. Oh, someone stronger may be found in that time, but there won't be fifty, and there may be none. We dwindle. Moiraine's ears pricked. Did Cadswain have some solution to the problem? But how could any solution involve her? I don't understand, Lorella said sharply. She seemed to have gathered herself, and to be angry for her previous weakness. We are all aware of the issue, but what does Moiraine have to do with it? Do you think she can somehow attract more girls to the tower? Girls with... with stronger potential? She had to force that last out, grimacing in disgust, and her snort said what she thought of the notion. I would regret her being wasted before she knows up from down. The tower can't afford to lose her out of her own ignorance. Look at her. A pretty little doll of a Kyrian noble. Cadswain put a finger under Moiraine's chin, tilting it up. Before you find a warder like that, child, a brigand who wants to see what's in your purse will put an arrow through your heart. A footpad who'd faint at the sight of a sister in her sleep will crack your head, and you'll wake at the back of an alley minus your gold and maybe more. I suspect you'll want to take as much care choosing your first man as you do your first warder. Moiraine jerked back, spluttered with indignation. First her and Swan, now this. There were things one talked about, and things one did not. Catswain ignored her outrage. Calmly sipping her wine, she turned back to the others. Until she does find a warder to guard her back, it might be best to protect her from her own enthusiasm. You two are going to touch in, I believe. She'll travel with you, then. I expect you not to let her out of your sight. Moiraine found her tongue, but her protests did as much good as her indignation had. Marian and Lorella objected, too, just as vociferously. I said I did not need looking after, no matter how new. They had interests of their own to look after. They did not make clear what those were, or whether they were shared between them. Few sisters would have, but plainly neither wanted company. Catswain paid no attention to anything she did not want to hear, 
assumed they would do as she wished, pressed wherever they offered an opening. Soon, the pair were twisting on their chairs and reduced to saying that they had encountered each other only the day before and were not sure they would be traveling on together. In any event, both meant to spend two or three days in Canlewum, while Moiraine wanted to leave today. The child will stay until you leave, Catswain said briskly. Good, that's done then. I'm sure you two want to see to whatever brought you to Canlewum. I won't keep you. Lorella shifted her shawl irritably at the abrupt dismissal, then stalked out, muttering that Moiraine would regret it if she got underfoot or slowed her reaching Chachin. Marian took it better, saying she would look after Moiraine like a daughter, though her smile hardly looked pleased. When they were gone, Moiraine stared at Cadswain incredulously. She had never seen anything like it, except an avalanche, once. The thing to do now was keep silent until she had a chance to leave without Cadswain or the others seeing. Much the wisest thing. I agreed to nothing, she said coolly, very coolly. What if I have affairs in Chachin that will not wait? What if I do not choose to wait here two or three days? Perhaps she did need to learn to school her tongue a little more. Cadswain had been looking thoughtfully at the door that had closed behind Marian and Lorella, but she turned a piercing gaze on Moiraine. You've worn the shawl only four months or so, and you have affairs that cannot wait? Faw! You still haven't learned the first real lesson. That the shawl means you are ready to truly begin learning. The second lesson is caution. I know better than most how hard that is to find when you're young and have sidar at your fingertips and the world at your feet. As you think. Moiraine tried to fit a word in, but she might as well have stood in front of that avalanche. You will take great risks in your life if you live long enough. You already take more than you know. Heed carefully what I say. And do as I say. I will check your bed tonight, and if you are not in it, I will find you and make you weep as you did for those mice. You can dry your tears afterward on that shawl you believe makes you invincible. It does not. Staring as the door closed behind Cadswain, Moiraine suddenly realized she still held the cup of wine and gulped it dry. The woman was... formidable. Custom forbade physical violence against another sister, but Cadswain had not sidestepped a hair in her threat. She had said it right out. So by the three oaths, she meant it exactly. Incredible. Was it happenstance that she had mentioned Malin Arganya and Karin Nagashi? They were two of Tamra's searchers. Could Kedzwain be another? Either way, she had very neatly cut Moiraine out of the hunt for the next week or more. If she actually went with Marian and Lorella, at least. But why only a week? If the woman was part of the search, if Catsway knew about her and Swan, if... Standing there, fiddling with an empty wine cup, was getting her nowhere. She snatched up her cloak. Chapter 18 A Narrow Passage A number of people looked around at Moiraine when she came out into the common room, some with sympathy in their eyes. Doubtless they were imagining what it must be like to be the focus of attention for three eyes to die, and they could not imagine any good in it. There was no commiseration on any sister's face. Most took hardly any notice of her at all. Falana wore a pleased smile, though, probably thinking the Lady Alice's name as good as written in the novice book. At least she did not know the truth, not with that smile. There was some hope of staying hidden from Sierra in a while longer. Cadswain was nowhere in sight, nor the other two. Picking her way through the tables, Moiraine felt as though she had been spun like a top. There were too many questions, and not an answer to be found. She wished Swan were there, with her ability to solve puzzles. And nothing shook Swan. She could have used Swan's presence for the steadying alone. A young woman looked in at the door from the street, then jerked out of sight. Moiraine missed a step. Wish for something hard enough and you could think you saw it. 
The woman peeked in again, the hood of her cloak fallen atop the bundle on her back. And it really was Swan, sturdy and handsome in one of Tamora's plain blue riding dresses. This time she saw Moiraine, but instead of rushing to greet her, Swan nodded up the street and vanished again. Heart climbing into her throat, Moiraine swept her cloak around her and went out. Down the street, Swan was slipping through the traffic, glancing back at every third step. A wagon driver hauled her reins hard to avoid running Swan down and cracked her whip over Swan's head, but Swan seemed unaware of the horses snorting in their traces, or the whip, or the wagon driver's angry shouts. Moiraine followed quickly, worry growing. Another three or four years would pass before Swan gained enough strength to tell Satalia she was leaving the job as Satalia's assistant. There would be snow at Sunday before the woman let her go short of that. And the only other possibility for her being in Canloam... Warren groaned, and a big-eared fellow selling pins from a tray gave her a concerned look. She glared so hard that he started back. Perhaps Swan had let something slip. Or maybe her book of names had been found, or... No. How it happened did not matter. Sierra must have found out about everything. It would be just like the woman to send Swan to bring her back, so their worry could feed on each other during the long ride. Maybe she was building phantasms, but she could not imagine another explanation. A hundred paces from the inn, Swan looked back once more, paused till she was sure that Moiraine saw her, then darted into an alley. Moiraine quickened her stride and followed. Her friend was pacing beneath the still unlit oil lamps that lined this narrow, dusty passage. The dark blue dress showed signs of hard travel, creases and stains, dust. Nothing frightened Swan, yet fear glittered in those sharp blue eyes now. Moiraine opened her mouth to confirm her own fears about Sierrin, but the taller woman spoke first. Light! I thought I'd never bloody find you! Tell me you found him, Moiraine. Tell me the Najima boy's the one, and we can hand him to the tower with a hundred sisters watching and it's done! A hundred sisters? No, Swan, he is not. This did not sound like Sierrin. What is the matter? Why did you come yourself instead of sending a message? Swan began to weep. Swan, who had a lion's heart. Tears spilled down her cheeks. Throwing her arms around Moiraine, she squeezed hard enough to make Moiraine's ribs ache. She was trembling. I couldn't trust this to a pigeon, she mumbled. Or to any of the eyes and ears. I wouldn't have dared. They're all dead. Aisha and Kareen. Valera and Ludis and Malin. They say Aisha and her warder were killed by bandits in Murindy. Kareen supposedly fell off a ship in the Alguenya during a storm and drowned. And Malin... Malin! Sobs racked her so she could not go on. Moiraine hugged her back, making soothing sounds, and staring past Swan's shoulder in consternation. Accidents do happen, she said slowly. Bandits, storms... Aes Sedai can die as easily as anyone else. She was having a hard time making herself believe. All of them? Her father used to say that once was happenstance, twice might be coincidence, but thrice or more indicated the actions of your enemies. He said he had read it somewhere. But what enemies? A thought occurred and she forced it down. Some things did not bear thinking. Swan pushed herself away from Moiraine's embrace. You don't understand! Malin! Grimacing, she scrubbed at her eyes. Fish guts! I'm not making this clear. Get hold of yourself, you bloody fool! That last was growled to herself. Guiding Moiraine to an upended cask with no bung, she sat Moiraine down and shrugged off the bundle from her own back. If that was all she was traveling with, likely she did not have so much as a spare dress. You won't want to be standing when you hear what I have to say. For that matter, I bloody well don't want to be standing myself. 
Dragging a crate with broken slats from further up the alley, she settled on it, fussing with her skirts, peering toward the street, muttering about people looking in as they passed. Her reluctance did nothing to soothe Moiraine's fluttering stomach. It seemed to do little for swans, either. When she started again, she kept pausing to swallow, like a woman who wanted to sick up. Malin returned to the tower almost a month ago. I don't know why. She didn't say where she had been, or where she was going, but she only meant to stay a few nights. I... I'd heard about Kareen the morning Malin came back, and the others before that. So I decided to speak to her. Don't look at me that way. I know how to be cautious. Cautious? Swan? Warren could have laughed. Only she knew if she did, it might well tip over into tears of her own. This was madness. It had to be madness. She shoved that horrible thought away again. There had to be another explanation. There had to be. Anyway, I sneaked into her rooms and hid under the bed. So the servants wouldn't see me when they turned down her sheets. Swan grunted sourly. I fell asleep under there. Sunrise woke me and her bed hadn't been slept in. So I sneaked out again, not easy that time of morning, but I'm sure nobody saw me, and went down to the second sitting of breakfast. And while I was spooning my porridge, Chesmal Emery came in to... She... She announced that Malin had been found in her bed, that she died during the night. She finished in a rush and sagged, staring at Moiraine. Moiraine was very glad to be sitting. Her knees would not have supported a feather. It was madness. Murder had been done. The Red Aja, she suggested finally. A Red might kill a sister she thought intended to protect a man who could channel. It was possible, but she could not have said it aloud because she did not believe it. Swan snorted. Malin didn't have a mark on her. Yellows delved her, of course. They'd have detected poison or smothering. They found nothing and called it a natural death, but I know it wasn't. It couldn't be, not the way they found her. No marks. That means the power, Moiraine. Could even a red do that? Her voice was fierce, but she pulled the bundle up, clutching it on her lap. She seemed to be hiding behind it. Still, there was less fear on her face than anger now. Think, Moiraine. Tamra supposedly died in her sleep, too. Only we know Malin didn't, no matter where she was found. First Tamra, then the others started dying. The only thing that makes sense is that someone noticed her calling sisters in and wanted to know why badly enough that they bloody risked putting the Amarlin seat herself to the question. They had to have something to hide to do that. Something they'd hazard anything to keep hidden. They killed her to hide it. To hide what they'd done. And then they set out to kill the rest. Which means they don't want the boy found, not alive. They don't want the dragon reborn at the last battle. Any other way to look at it is tossing the slop bucket into the wind and hoping for the best. Unconsciously, Moiraine peered toward the mouth of the alley. A few people walking by glanced in, but none more than once. No one paused at seeing them seated there. Some things were easier to speak of when you were not too specific. The Armorlin had been put to the question. She had been killed. Not Tamra. Not a name that brought up the familiar face. Someone had murdered her. They did not want the Dragon Reborn found. Putting someone to the question with the power violated none of the three oaths. But murder using Sidar certainly did. Even for... For those Moiraine did not want to name any more than Swan did. Forcing her face to smoothness, forcing her voice to calm, she forced the words out. The Black Aja. Swan flinched, then nodded, glowering. Almost any sister grew angry at the suggestion that a secret Aja existed, hidden inside the others, an Aja dedicated to the Dark One. Most sisters refused to listen to any mention of it. The White Tower had stood for the light for over 3,000 years, but some sisters did not deny the Black straight out. Some believed. 
Very few would admit it even to another sister, though. Moiraine did not want to admit it to herself. Swan plucked fretfully at the ties on her bundle, but she went on in a brisk voice. I don't think they have our names. Tamra never really thought us part of it. She told us to be quiet, put us aside, and forgot us. Else I'd have had an accident, too. Just before I left, I slipped a note with my suspicions under Sierran's door. Not about the boy, about the... About the black. Only I didn't know how much to trust her even there. The Armorland seat. But if it's real, then anybody could belong. Anybody. I wrote it with my left hand, but I was shaking so hard no one could recognize my writing if I'd used my right. Burn my liver. Even if we knew who to trust, we have bilge water for proof. Enough for me. Light. The Black Aja. If they know everything, all the women Tamra chose, there may be none left except us. We will have to move fast if we have a hope of finding the boy. It all seemed hopeless. Who could say how many black sisters there might be? Twenty? Fifty? And a terrible thought. More? But Moiraine tried for a vigorous tone, too. It was gratifying that Swan only nodded. She would not give up for all her talk of shaking, and she never considered that Moiraine might. Most gratifying, especially when she still doubted her knees. Perhaps they know us, and perhaps not. Perhaps they think they can leave two new sisters for last. In any case, we cannot trust anyone but ourselves. The blood drained from her face, and she suddenly felt lightheaded. Oh, light! I just had an encounter at the inn, Swan. She tried to recall every word, every nuance from the moment Marian first spoke. Swan listened with a distant look, filing and sorting. Katswain could be Black Aja, she agreed, when Moiraine finished. She barely hesitated over the words. Maybe she's just trying to get you out of the way until she can dispose of you without rousing suspicion. Or she could be one of Tamra's chosen. Just because we think she hasn't been in Tarvalon for two years doesn't make it so. Sisters did slip in and out of the tower quietly sometimes, but Moiraine thought that anywhere Cadswain arrived shook, as though struck by an earthquake. The trouble is, any of them could be either. Leaning across her bundle, she touched Moiraine's knee. Can you bring your horse from the stable without being seen? I have a good mount, but I don't know if she can carry both of us. We should be hours from here before they know we're gone. Moiraine smiled in spite of herself. She very much doubted the good mount. Any horse trader could pass off a broken-down cart horse as a charger to Swan, whose eye for horse flesh was no better than her seat in the saddle. The ride north must have been agony for her, and full of fear. No one knows you are here at all, Swan, she said. Best if it stays so. You have your book? Good. If I remain until morning, I will have a day's start on them instead of hours. You go on to Chachin now. Take some of my coin. By the state of Swan's dress, she had spent the last part of that trip sleeping under bushes. She would not have dared draw much from the tower's bank before leaving. Start searching for the Lady Ines, and I will catch you up there looking for Avin Sahira on the way. It was not that easy, of course. Swan had a stubborn streak as wide as the Aaron, and... I have enough for my needs, she grumbled. But Moiraine insisted on handing her half the coins in her purse, and when Moiraine reminded her of their pledge during their first months in the tower, that what one owned belonged to the other as well, she muttered, We swore we'd find beautiful young princes to bond to and marry them besides. Girls say all sorts of silly things. You watch after yourself now. You leave me alone in this and I'll wring your neck. Embracing to say goodbye, Moiraine found it hard to let go. An hour ago, her worries had been how long she could escape Sierran's justice and the birch. Now that seemed like worrying over stubbing her toe. The Black Aja. She wanted to empty her stomach. If only she had Swan's courage. Watching Swan slip down the alley, adjusting that bundle on her back again, Moiraine wished she were green. She would have liked at least three or four warders to guard her back right then. 
Walking back up the street, she could not help looking at everyone she passed, man or woman. If the Black Aja, her stomach twisted every time she thought that name. If they were involved, then ordinary dark friends were too. No one denied that some misguided people believed the Dark One would give them immortality. People who would kill and do every sort of evil to gain that hoped-for reward. And if any sister could be Black Aja, anyone she met could be a Dark Friend. She hoped Swan remembered that. As she approached the Gates of Heaven, a sister appeared in the inn's doorway. Part of a sister, at least. All she could see was an arm with a fringed shawl over it, and that just for an instant. A very tall man who had just come out, his hair in two belled braids, turned back to speak for a moment, but a hand gestured peremptorily, and he strode past Moiraine wearing a scowl. She would not have thought twice of it if not for thinking about the Black Aja and Dark Friends. The Light knew Aes Sedai did speak to men, and some did more than speak. She had been thinking of dark friends, though, and black sisters. If only she could have made out the color of that fringe. She hurried the last thirty-odd paces, frowning. Marian and Lorella were seated together by themselves near the door, both still wearing their shawls. Few sisters did that except for ceremony, or for show. Both women were watching Cadswain go into that private sitting room, followed by a pair of lean, grey-haired men who looked hard as last year's oak. She still wore her shawl, too, with the white flame of Tarvalin bright on her back amid the woven vines. It could have been any of them. Cadswain might be looking for another warder. Greens always seemed to be looking. Marian or Lorella might be, too. Neither had one, unless bonded since she left Tarvalon. The fellow's scowl might have been for hearing he did not measure up. There were a hundred possible explanations, and she put the man out of her head. The sure dangers were real enough without inventing more. Before she was three steps into the common room, Master Helvin bustled up in a green-striped apron, a bald-headed man nearly as wide as he was tall, and handed her a new irritation. Ah, Lady Alice, just who I was looking for. With three more Aes Sedai stopping here, I fear I need to shuffle the beds again. Certainly you won't mind sharing yours under the circumstances. Mistress Palin is a most pleasant woman. Under the circumstances? Under any normal circumstances, he would never have dared suggest doubling to a noble woman, no matter how many merchants he had to push into one bed. But what he meant was, since she would soon be off to the White Tower. In fact, he more than suggested. He had already moved the woman in. And when she protested, If you're displeased, I suggest you speak to one of the eyes to die, he said in a firm voice. A firm voice? To her? Now, if you'll excuse me, I have many things to take care of. We're very busy right now. And off he bustled without another word, or even a bow. She could have screamed. She very nearly channeled to give him a clout on the ear. Hazel Palin was a rug merchant from Murundi with the lilt of Lugard in her voice. Moiraine heard more of it than she wanted from the moment she stepped into the small room that had been hers alone. Her clothes had been moved from the wardrobe to pegs on the wall, her comb and brush displaced from the washstand for Mistress Palin's. The plump, graying woman in fine brown woolens surely would have been diffident with Lady Alice, but not with a wilder who everybody said was off in the morning to become a novice in the White Tower. She lectured Moiraine on the duties of a novice, all of her information wrong. Some of what she suggested would have killed most of the novices in a week, if not on the first day, and the rest was just impossible. Learn to fly? The woman was mad. She followed Moiraine down to supper and gathered other traders of her acquaintance at the table, every woman of them eager to share what she knew of the White Tower, which was nothing at all. They shared it in great detail, though. If Moiraine truly had been a potential novice, they would have frightened her out of going anywhere near the tower. She thought to escape by retiring early, but Mistress Palin appeared almost as soon as she had her dress off and talked until she dropped off to sleep. 
It was not an easy night. The bed was narrow, the woman's elbows sharp, and her feet icy despite thick blankets trapping the warmth of the small tiled stove built in beneath the bed. Ignoring cold air was one thing. Icy feet were quite something else. The rainstorm that had threatened all day broke, wind and thunder rattling the shutters for hours. Moiraine doubted she could have slept in any event. Dark friends and the black Aja danced in her head. She saw Tamra being dragged from her sleep, dragged away to somewhere secret and tortured by women wielding the power. Sometimes the women wore Marian's face and Lorella's and Cadswain's and every sister's she had ever seen. Sometimes Tamra's face became her own. When the door creaked slowly open in the dark hours of morning, Moiraine embraced the source in a flash. Sidar filled her to the point where the sweetness and joy came close to pain. Not as much of the power as she would be able to handle in another year, much less five. Yet a hair more would burn the ability out of her now, or kill her. One was as bad as the other, but she wanted to draw more, and not just because the power always made you want more. Catswain put her head in. Moiraine had forgotten her promise, her threat. The green sister saw the glow, of course, could feel how much she held. Fool girl, was all the woman said before leaving. Moiraine counted to one hundred slowly, then swung her feet out from under the covers. Now was as good a time as any. Mistress Palin heaved onto her side and began to snore. It sounded like canvas ripping. Even so, Moiraine took care to be quiet. Channeling fire, she lit one of the lamps and dressed hurriedly. A riding dress this time, in dark blue silk and embroidered on the neck and sleeves in a golden pattern like Maldine lace. Reluctantly, she decided to abandon her saddlebags along with everything else she had to leave behind. Anyone who saw her moving about might not think too much of it, even this time of the morning, but not if she had saddlebags over her shoulder. All she took was what she could fit into the pockets sewn inside her cloak, her brush and comb and sewing kit, some spare stockings and a clean shift. There was no room for more. It was enough, with the letter of rights and the remaining gold in her belt pouch. Mistress Palin was still snoring as she closed the door behind her. Chapter 19 Pond Water the common room was empty at that hour, though the clatter of pots and the murmur of voices through the kitchen door told of preparations for breakfast. She hurried out through a side door into the inn's stable yard. Unseen, she was sure. So far, so good. The sky was just beginning to turn grey, and the air retained every ounce of the night's chill, but at least the rain had stopped. There was a weave to keep rain off, but it did tend to attract notice. Gathering her skirts and cloak to keep them out of the puddles on the paving stones, she quickened her step. The faster gone, the less chance of being seen. Not that she could avoid every eye. The hinges creaked softly as she opened one of the stable doors to slip inside, and the coatless groom on night duty jumped to his feet from the stool, where he had no doubt been dozing with his back against a thick roof post. A skinny, hook-nosed fellow with the tilted eyes of Saldeia, he raked his fingers through his hair, in a useless effort to straighten it, and made a jerky bow. How may I help, my lady? he asked in a raspy voice. Saddle my mare, Kazin, she said, putting a silver penny in his ready hand. It was very good luck that this same man had been on duty when she arrived, too. Master Helvin had written a description of Arrow in the stable book, sitting on a slanted ledge by the doors, but she very much doubted Kazin could read. The silver had him knuckling his forehead and scurrying for Arrow's stall. Likely, he more often received coppers. She regretted leaving her pack horse behind, but not even a fool noble, she had heard Kazin mutter, who oh, but a fool noble would ride out at this hour, would take a pack animal for a morning jaunt. At best, he would hurry inside to find out whether she was paid in full with the innkeeper. She was, and for another night besides, but there was always the chance Cadswain had promised the servants rewards to watch her movements. In the Green Sister's place, she would have. 
This way, no one would suspect anything until she failed to return that night. Climbing into Arrow's high-cantled saddle, she gave the groom a cool smile because of his comment and rode slowly out into damp, nearly empty streets. Just out for a ride, however early. It looked to be a good day. The sky looked rained out, for one thing, with barely a cloud blocking the stars, and there was little wind. The lamps high on the walls of every building were still lit all along the streets and alleys, leaving no more than the palest shadow anywhere, yet the only people to be seen were the Night Watch's helmeted patrols, with their halberds and crossbows, and the lamplighters, just as heavily armed as they made their rounds to make sure no lamp went out. A wonder that people could live so close to the blight that a murdral could step out of any dark shadow. Night watchmen and lamplighters alike eyed her with surprise as she rode by. No one went out in the night. Not in the borderlands. Which was why she was surprised to see she was not the first to reach the western gates. Slowing Arrow, she stayed well back from the three very large men waiting with a pack horse behind their mounts. None wore helmet or armor, but each wore a sword at his hip and carried a heavy horse bow with a bristling quiver tied in front of his saddle. Few men went unarmed in these lands. Their attention was all on the barred gates, with now and again a word shared with the gate guards. They seemed impatient for the gates to open and barely glanced in her direction. The lamps near the gates showed their faces clearly. A grizzled old man and a hard-faced young one in dark knee-long coats with braided leather cords tied around their heads. Malkieri? She thought that was what that cord meant. The third was an Arafelin with belled braids in a dark yellow coat sewn with more bells, the same fellow she had seen leaving the gates of heaven. By the time a bright sliver of sunrise on the horizon allowed the gates to be swung wide, several merchants' trains had lined up to depart. The three men were first through, but Moiraine let a dozen tall, canvas-covered wagons behind six-horse teams rumble ahead of her, with their outriding guards in helmets and breastplates, before she followed across the bridge and onto the road through the hills. She kept the three in sight, though. They were heading in the same direction so far, after all. They moved quickly, good riders who barely shifted a rein, but speed suited her. The more distance she put between herself and Cadswain, the better. She stayed only close enough to maintain sight of the men. No need to attract their attention until she wished. At that pace, the merchant's wagons and their guards fell behind long before she saw the first village near midday, a small cluster of tile-roofed two-story stone houses around a tiny inn on a forested hill slope beside the road. Even after several months, it still seemed odd to see villagers wearing swords, and at least one halberd racked outside every door. Crossbows and quivers, too. It made stark contrast to the children rolling hoops and tossing beanbags in the street. The three men never slowed or turned an eye toward the village, but Moiraine paused long enough to purchase part of a loaf of crusty pale bread and a narrow wedge of hard yellow cheese, and ask whether anyone knew a woman named Avin Sahira. The answer was no, and she galloped on until the three appeared on the hard-packed road ahead, their horses still in that ground-eating pace. Maybe they knew nothing more than the name of the sister the Arafelin had spoken to, but anything at all she learned about Catswain or the other two would be to the good. She formulated several plans for approaching them, and discarded each. Three men on a deserted forest road could well decide a young woman alone was a heaven-sent opportunity, especially if they were what she feared. Handling them presented no difficulty if it came to that, but she wanted to avoid that. Should they turn out to be dark friends or simply brigands, she would have to hold them prisoner long enough to hand them over to some authority. No telling how long that would take. And besides, there would be no hiding that she was Aes Sedai then. News of a woman capturing three outlaws, hardly an event of every day, would spread like wildfire in dry timber. She might as well weave a great column of fire above her head to help anyone who wanted to find her. Forest gave way to scattered farms, and farms faded to more forest, towering fir and pine and leather leaf, massive oaks with only tiny red leaf buds on their thick branches. 
a red crested eagle soared overhead not twenty paces up and became a shape against the descending sun. The road ahead was empty except for the three men and their pack animal and bear of life behind as well. Decent people would be at their suppers. Not that there was so much as a farmhouse in evidence here. As her shadow stretched out behind her, she decided to forget the men and begin looking for a place to sleep. With luck, she might see more farms soon, and if a little silver did not bring a bed, a hayloft would have to do. Without luck, her saddle would suffice for a pillow, if a hard one. A meal would be nice, though. That bread and cheese seemed a very long way back. Ahead, the three men suddenly stopped in the middle of the road, conferring for a moment. She drew rein where she was. Even if they noticed, proper caution for a woman alone called on her not to ride up on them. Then one of the fellows took the pack horse and turned aside into the forest. The others dug in their heels and rode on at a quicker pace, as though suddenly remembering somewhere they needed to be. Moiraine frowned. The Arafelin was one of the pair rushing off, but since they were traveling together, Maybe he had mentioned meeting an eyes to die to his companion left behind. The younger Malkieri, she thought. People did talk about encounters of that sort. Relatively few people had actually met a sister and known who or what she was. And one man would certainly be less trouble than three, if she was careful. Riding to where rider and pack horse had vanished, she dismounted and began searching for sign. Most ladies left tracking to their huntsmen, but she had taken an interest in the years when climbing trees and getting dirty had seemed equal fun. It appeared this man was no woodsman, though. Broken twigs and kicked winterfall leaves left the trail a child could have followed. A hundred paces or so into the forest, she spotted a wide pond in a hollow through the trees, and the younger of the Malkieri. He had already unsaddled and hobbled his bay, a fine-looking animal, much too fine for his worn coat, perhaps the sign of a bandit, and was setting the pack saddle on the ground. He looked even larger this close, with very wide shoulders and a narrow waist. Far from a pretty man, too. Not unhandsome with that hard, angular face. A suitable face for a brigand. Unbuckling his sword belt, he sat down cross-legged facing the pond, laid sword and belt beside him, and put his hands on his knees. He seemed to be staring off across the water, still glittering through the late afternoon shadows, toward the water reeds that rimmed the far bank. He did not move a muscle. Moiraine considered. Plainly, he had been left to make camp. The others would return, but not quickly, since he was slacking his task. A question or two would not take long. Which of you met an Aes Sedai recently might be enough. And if he was unnerved a little, say it finding her suddenly standing right behind him, he might answer before he thought. Saidar must be left till last. She would have to use it almost certainly, but let the fact that she could channel come as an added surprise. Tying Arrow's reins to a low branch on a leather leaf, she gathered her cloak and skirts and moved forward as silently as possible. A small hummock lay behind him, and she stepped up onto that. Added height could help. He was a very tall man. And it might also help if he found her with her belt knife in one hand and his sword in the other. Channeling, she whisked the scabbarded blade from his side. Every little bit of shock she could manage for him. He moved faster than thought. No one so large could move so fast, yet her grasp closed on the scabbard and he uncoiled, whirling, one hand clutching the scabbard between hers, the other seizing the front of her dress. Before she could think to channel, she was flying through the air. She had just time to see the pond coming up at her, just time to shout something she did not know what, and then she struck the surface flat, driving all the wind out of her, struck with a great splash and sank. The water was freezing! Sidar fled in her shock. Floundering to her feet, she stood up to her waist in the icy water, coughing, wet hair clinging to her face, sodden cloak dragging at her shoulders. Furiously, she twisted around to confront her attacker, furiously embraced the source once more, prepared to knock him down and drub him till he squealed. 
He stood shaking his head and frowning in puzzlement at the spot where she had stood, a long stride from where he had been sitting. She might as well have been a fish. When he deigned to notice her, he put down the scabbarded sword and came to the edge of the pond, bending to stretch out a hand. Unwise to try separating a man from his sword, he said, and after a glance at the colored slashes on her dress added, My lady? Hardly an apology. His startlingly blue eyes did not quite meet hers. If he was hiding mirth... Muttering under her breath, she splashed awkwardly to where she could take his outstretched hand in both of hers, and heaved with all of her might. Ignoring icy water trickling down your ribs was not easy, and if she was wet, so would he be, and without any need to use the one. He straightened, raised his arm, and she came out of the water dangling from his hand. In consternation, she stared at him until her feet touched the ground and he backed away. I'll start a fire and hang out blankets so you can dry yourself, he murmured, still not meeting her gaze. What was he hiding? Or perhaps he was shy? She had never heard of a shy, dark friend, though she supposed there could be some. He was as good as his word, and by the time the other men reappeared, she was standing beside a small fire surrounded by blankets dug from his pack saddles and hung from the branches of an oak. She had no need of the fire for drying, of course. The proper weave of water had taken every drop from her hair and clothes while she stayed in them. As well he did not see that, though. Or her, until her hair was combed straight and brushed. And she did appreciate the flame's warmth. Anyway, she had to stay inside the blankets long enough for the man to think she had used the fire as he intended. She very definitely held on to Sidar. So far, she had proof of nothing. Did she follow you, Lan? A man's voice said as he dismounted to the jingle of bells. The Arafelon. Why are those blankets up? A sour voice demanded gruffly. Moiraine stared at nothing, missing what reply her assailant made to the questions. They had known? Men watched for bandits in these times, but they had noticed a lone woman and decided she was following them? It made no sense. But why lure her into the woods instead of just confronting her? Three men had no reason to fear one woman. Unless they knew she was Aes Sedai, they would step very cautiously then. But she was certain the fellow had no idea how she had gotten hold of his sword. A Kyrian in Lan? I suppose you've seen a Kyrianin in her skin, but I never have. That certainly caught her ear, and with the power filling her, so did another sound. Steel whispering on leather. A sword leaving its sheath. Preparing several weaves that would stop the lot of them in their tracks, she made a crack in the blankets to peek out.